for now. Good morning. Good morning. We're about to start. Just wanted to welcome all of you for being here this morning. I will go through some housekeeping items before we get started. I want to congratulate our City 4 team because if you notice, there's not a whole bunch of cables and cameras all around. Um, we have a great system that mimics the one that we have over at City Hall. And because of that, I'm going to ask every single council member to please, when you speak, to try to make sure that you talk to your microphone so that the communication gets through to the people at home. And then in addition to that, if somebody wants to make sure that they want to see what the cameras are doing, if you look at the back of the room, there's a screen back there and you can kind of see what's happening and what people at home are watching. Today? Uh, assuming somebody is watching. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty early. <laughs> I'm sure that nobody would like to be anywhere else other than here right now, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the reruns, you know, the reruns. Exactly. No, it's, it's, I just want to say thank you to all the fellow council members and the staff for being here so early on the morning on a Saturday. I know that it is a challenge, but it's part of the sacrifice that we do as public servants. Um, not only us council members, but also the staff that this is a weekend day for them, and they are all here. So just want to say thank you to the department heads and everybody that's here today um, for your sacrifice. Just a bit of an overview before we have the meeting call to order. Just wanted to let everybody at home know that we're excited to start off this budget. I will start by saying that there is no mill levy increase. So if that's what you were waiting for, you could go home. <laughs> um, the staff has worked arduously this whole year to take a look at efficiencies and to take a look at how we can make our city a better place for all of you. And as part of that, we will go today through some highlights. I am not going to get into that because our budget manager is going to do that, but just wanted to to, again, tell you about a few things that we're going to do in the meeting. So as an old facilitator, I, I know that teaching adults and working with adults is something that you have people for three hours in a meeting and it kind of gets a little tense or you kind of find yourself trying to find something to do. At your tables, you will find it. Everybody has Play-Doh in their hand, uh, in, at their access. So if you feel like you are getting a little bit tense or if you feel like you need to do something tactile, um, there's Play-Doh. I sure know that I will be using it at some points when I'm listening to the presentation. Sorry, city manager, if you didn't have one, I'd be happy to share mine with you in half. Um, the other thing that we would like to do this year is that there's, there's some times in the meeting that we are having a lot of questions that go a little bit deeper than what we're used to. So again, these are facilitator tools. Tell me if you don't like them for the next meeting, but um, I want for all of us to be able to say parking lot at any point in time in the meeting. So it's not just gonna be me saying parking lot. I think that all of us um, are adults and if we feel that we're getting into a deep discussion that may be needing some additional information that we feel like staff can provide, not only to us, but put them on the website, if we say parking lot, we have staff that is going to get up. They're going to write down the item that's gonna be parking lotted and we will come back to it. Um, and then finally, I just want to say to the public that this has been, seeing us here today really is not a reflection of the budget starts today. This has been a very long process. I'm taking- Look forward to it. Ready to go. <laughs> City manager. Way. Uh, thank you. So uh, excellent introduction. I think the, the, you hit on the two key points. Number one is that there has been a tremendous amount of effort on the part of the staff to prep uh, for this effort. And when we talk about that, we really talk about this concept of continual improvement that we've tried to apply uh, to the, the way in which the city operates. And we go back and we actually looked at last year's budget meetings. Uh, we've asked questions of ourselves as how could we do it better? And I think that what you're going to see hopefully uh, is the output of that. Of a, uh, of, a, of a process which is a operationally focused on best practices but also reflects how this body operates and, and anticipate what your questions, what your needs are. And so hopefully this is a, uh, a, a very good, seamless and intuitive process as we go forward. Secondly, I think it's very important to understand that, that we understand uh, where we're at from a financial position We've looked very closely at the revenues. Uh, I think we do a phenomenal job uh, at projecting revenues within this organization. And <laughs> if anything, we're a little bit too conservative and we end up with uh, fairly significant uh, cash flow, uh, our cash um, uh, reserves at the end of the year that we're able to either 
uh, add to the fund balances or, as we did this last year, invested into very important deferred maintenance projects. Uh, but we are we work very diligently to make sure that we bring to this body. A look at here uh, at our documents and we start talking about priorities um, months before we even come here. We're analyzing, we have a full-time budget person that is analyzing our expenditures, that is analyzing our revenue streams, that is working on all of this. Then after that, council gets together and we all decide on priorities. This year, if you take a look at the book for the council members and for all of you at home, if you go to www.topeka.org backslash budget, you will have the same access that council members have to the book. Impacts this year and, and future impacts in, in the future uh, going forward. Please. Mr. Gerber. Good morning. Good morning. Before I start talking about this, um, I'll just say it's amazing to hear the excitement in everyone's voice. Deputy Mayor, you really set the tone this morning. This is an exciting time. Even after 20 years of doing budgets, this is, this is really the best time of the year because it's when we're going to figure out how we're going to impact our citizens for the upcoming year, how we're going to touch their lives, and how we're going to make an impact on our city moving forward. So we're excited to be here. Talking about the tax lid legislation, there's been a lot of talk about that uh, across the state, and we've had some discussions with council about that as well. The first thing I would point to, you have a handout in front of you, and that was prepared by the League of Kansas Municipalities. Not sure which staff member did it, whether Eric did it himself or um, Eric Smith perhaps might have done it, but it's a, it's a well done document, it's comprehensive, and rather than reinvent the wheel, we decided to um, put that in front of you and it kind of lays out what I'm going to walk through. The first point I would hit is that there's been some confusion after the uh, late in the legislative session this year, they made some changes. One of those was the implementation date of January 1st, 2017. That's caused a little bit of confusion across the state and even um, among staffs. Um, that implementation date is January 1st, 2017, but that means budgets adopted after that date. So the confusion was whether or not this particular budget, which is for FY 2017, January 17 to December 17, whether the tax lid is impacted by the budget we're talking about today and in the sub subsequent weeks, the tax lid does not impact that budget. Not to say that's not on our, it's on our mind, it's on your mind, but we are not officially operating under the tax lid until after the beginning of the year. Uh, the other significant change that came out of the uh, legislative session was we went from a five year or a one year average of the CIP, CPI, um, to a five year rolling average. So that was a significant um, positive benefit for cities across cities and counties across the state. So now we're able to rely on a five year CPI average or rolling average as opposed to the previous one year. Um, I believe we put some numbers in your budget as to what that average has been. Um, it's fairly low at this point. Yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gerber, could you explain for the folks at home what the consumer price index is? Sure. Um, the CPI is done by the Bureau of Labor uh, Labor Statistics, and it's a national average that sort of tries to uh, encapsulate how the economy is doing nationwide. There's a national CPI and then there's a regional CPI, like for example, the Kansas City metro area has a CPI. And it's just a factor of consumable goods, like, you know, they take some very specific things, like this type of apple costs this much now and a year ago or a year previous it costs this much, and then they, they do a comparison. They compare um, household durable goods, um, they compare gasoline, heating costs, um, I didn't really, I, I don't totally remember all the factors, but there's a number of factors that they compare. And then they just, they do an index of the previous year to the current year and how much the economy is uh, expanding or not. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> so the, the other point I think I would want to clarify today is that the tax lid does not prohibit cities from doing a mill levy increase. There's no prohibition against that. 
what the tax lid does is it requires cities and counties to follow certain steps if they want to do that. And specifically, if you want to raise your mill levy um, more than the five-year rolling CPI average, then you have to have a special election. So you can do that a number of ways. I won't bore you with the details, but it can be a special election. It can be at the next regular election in August or November, or it can be a mail-in election. So there are options if, if moving forward this, this policy body ever decides that they'd like to do that. Uh, the other thing I'd point out on here is that there's a number of exemptions in the tax lid, which I think are also generally beneficial for cities, uh, whether it's on the revenue or the expenditure side. The biggest among those is the exemption for public safety. So any increases in city budgets, county budgets that relate to public safety specifically do not count against your um, tax lid increase. So with that, I would uh, summarize by saying that <clears throat> This is not an ideal scenario for most cities, but it is what it is, and we're perfectly capable of working within it and working with you to make sure we craft the best budget under the, the guidelines of this new law. And I'd stand for questions if you have any. Are there any questions from the council? Thank Mayor you. Wolgas. Thank you. I would suggest that during the year we, as we develop our budget, that we look at it as if there were a <clears throat> the tax lid was in effect this year, so that perhaps by the end of this year or by fall, uh, we could see, start of that, that process of what it's like to have the tax lid in effect. Does that make sense? So that we could, you know, if, if it were in effect this year, what effect would it have? How are the exemptions working, et cetera? So uh, my thinking is it'd be good to have that experience so that we go into next year when it is in effect, we know better how what the um, what the um, differences will be that we have to take into consideration, Mr. Mr. Mayor. I think even by the end of this budget process, we could probably provide you with something that that speaks to that very subject. How how uh, if we were under the tax lid, how this might look. Thank you. Any other questions from the body? Comments. Okay, moving forward. Um, we're now going to enter into the budget overview portion of this. Oh, yes, sir. Deputy Mayor, just as a point of housekeeping, we, we may want to adopt the, approve the minutes from the last meeting. Absolutely. Um, we have in front of us and we have received the minutes of the last meeting of last year. Um, at this point, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Mr. Jensen second. moves. Mr. Cohen seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> now we would move into the uh, detail of the budget overview. And for that, we will call on our budget manager, Nikki Lee. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. Good morning for being, thank you for being here so early to you and all of the staff. So first of all, you have a few handouts in front of you. Just want to call attention to those so you can make sure um, to know what they are. Um, on the top, of course, you have the agenda and the minutes. Right underneath that should have been the overview of the tax lid that Mr. Gerber just walked through. Um, underneath that, and arguably where we will spend the most time today, you'll see a large legal size uh, piece of paper with colors and lines. What that is, this is page 10 of the budget book, which highlights the significant changes to the general fund. Um, but it's got notes to the side, and it's a little bit larger so that you can write on this a little bit easier. Um, and so that way you're not flipping around your book as much. I thought it'd be a lot easier to have a handout. So that is right in front of you. And then right underneath that, we have a pile of, you'd see on the top it says Executive Department Summary Reports. So last year we had a meeting um, in June, uh, um, especially to benefit some of the newer council members that really dove into uh, departments. So not just their budgets, but what do we do? Kind of give an overview of operations. And we decided this year that there was some really helpful information provided at that meeting. So for now, what we have done is provided, we had each department put together um, a handout kind of highlighting their department. And we said, try to focus on things not in the budget book. Don't repeat what you've already got. This one isn't necessarily about the numbers. It's more about the stats and kind of what's new. What are you working on this year? Um, so I know we just gave this to you today, so we don't expect that, you know, you'll obviously you're not going to read them during the meeting. but. If you go back and read them after this and have questions for the next meeting, 
Um, we can certainly draw more attention to those, but that's what you've got in front of you. Okay, so just quickly wanted to touch on the actual format of the budget book. Um, what you've got in front of you, as was stated before, is actually posted online as well. And um, also pretty exciting, it's on the budget portal. So for you all and for members of the, audit, of the public that would like to kind of dive in from the portal perspective, so kind of a, a clicking into the expenditures um, with a website format rather than a PDF that has been loaded to our website. You can get there from the home page. You can get there from our budget page or just budget.topeka.org. I would say that one focuses more on the numbers in a more interactive way, and the budget book kind of gives you more of the story. So to me, um, it's important to look at them both, but the budget portal is a really, really cool way, um, very easy to access from a phone for people to kind of get introduced and start to figure out where their questions and interests are. So the budget book in front of you, um, as was stated, we have been working on this budget process for uh, I mean, really a year. As soon as you finish the, the last year's budget, you start talking about the CIP, which you all adopted back in April. Um, after this meeting, there will be a series of two more budget committee meetings, which um, we'll highlight at the end of this meeting what the next meeting will be focusing on. Um, so the goal would be that by the 28th, which is the third budget committee meeting, we might be at a point to consider any amendments if necessary, and then also to approve the budget to uh, the larger governing body so that you all approve it so that it can go to the council meeting. And the reason for that timing is that on July 12th, the last of your meetings in July, that's when we need to set the public hearing and the maximum taxes levied. So that's a state requirement that before we get to the budget adoption in August, you all set the public hearing um, and then you also have to say our taxes will go no more than X amount of expenditures. That doesn't mean that something can't be changed with budget adoption in August, but the reason you set that then is so that then it's published along with the notice of the public hearing so that everybody is familiar with that. So just a quick <coughs> overview of your book. Um, behind the introduction section of the uh, book in front of you, there is some kind of background information. First of all, and very importantly, is the city manager's level, which hits on a lot of the themes. And it also calls attention to a lot of the items we'll be talking about that speak specifically to your budget priorities. So that's a pretty good narrative of what's in the book. Also call attention to on page eight is the budget calendar. Um, this is also on the website. So this one does line out what I just walked through really quickly, the budget committee meetings and kind of the next steps with the budget. Pages nine and 11 are probably the most important um, items in this budget document and these are the overall expenditure and revenue summaries so ultimately at the end of the day you all approving are approving the maximum expenditure authority with this budget so what you see on front of you um, on page nine eventually that's what will be on the state forms that we officially send to the state and say we will spend no more than X amount so this is kind of what brings it all together and then just really quickly wanted to walk through the format and the setup of all of the department pages. So if you'd like to turn, for example, to finance, which starts on page 25, the way that each department section is set up is that we've got a summary of the overall expenditures. Um, we explain uh, what fund those are all paid for. So for example, the finance department is all supported by the general fund, but we have many other departments, for example, public works that has multiple funding sources. There's a description by division um, of all of the different units within that department, the FTE count. There's a historical FTE count, so from the past three years and then this additional year, it explains where the FTEs have been and how they've changed. An organizational chart, and then finally, for example, on page 27 is uh, the detailed line item of that budget. So you've got two years of, of actuals, so what we actually spent, um, one years of 2016 budget next to 2017, and then the variance column, so that you can easily look at that department and see where the changes were. So what we will be focusing on today and focusing on the general fund are the largest changes to the budget. Um, that's really where I think the time is best spent is to talk about overall in this budget, where have the biggest changes been? Um, so what we'll do is we'll walk through that large handout that you have in front of you, um, which really pretty much every department is, is mentioned on that handout. So we'll pretty much get to 
all of the biggest areas in the budget just naturally by going through that handout. So the goal would be to get through that today and then follow up. Um, if we have any uh, items that go over past our 11 o'clock, then we can continue with the next meeting. So any questions before we get into some detail? Okay. Everybody can pull out their large sheet here. And for the public and people behind me, this is page 10 of the budget book. <coughs> so the way this is organized is this is organized by um, expenditure categories. So when we look at expenditures, we look at personnel, we look at contractuals, commodities, and capital outlay. So this is organized from the largest changes to the smallest changes by category, and then the changes on the revenue on the bottom. So the first two items on this list, um, as long as I've been here, I've been always the first two biggest changes to the budget, um, and that is full-time salaries and our contribution to health insurance. So the way that we always start the budget year is we first stop and we say, doing nothing else, what do we have to do with this budget? And as you can imagine, there's always, from the beginning, um, more to every budget year standing still. So if we change nothing else and we simply obligate our contracts, and do what we need to on the health insurance side, we're going into the year already knowing that we have an increase to the budget. So first of all, full-time salaries. What this is, is this is all full-time salaries for all departments combined into one, one line item. And as you can see, 2017 over 16, that increases 1.4 million. Um, this is pretty standard looking back at the last couple of years. Um, it goes up at least a million every year, at least it has for the past couple of years. And what that reflects is um, that does include any new positions built into the budget. Some, uh, so we've got documents in here and given some of you guys a preview about the new FTEs in the budget. Of those, six of those are in the general fund and actually technically two of those um, in the public works department are also, the costs are shared by other departments. So um, in total, there are six new positions that touch the general fund in some way, shape or form. And I can get into those in a minute. Um, <coughs> That also does include, um, it's a total of 3% increase for management and executive. What that reflects is a 2% cost of living increase, which is consistent with the increase that we had last year. And then that also incre includes a 1% merit pool. So that's something that we are trying to do better that we haven't been doing for the past couple of years is address um, performance and merit. So we've set some dollars aside to be able to uh, specifically focus them on um, high performers in the city. And then also the majority of that increase speaks to um, the increases in the contracts. So uh, for example, the IAFF, the fire contract, and the FOP, the police contract that you all saw, um, really over the last six months we've been going through all those negotiations. And in those negotiations we present what the impact would be if that, um, if that contract is approved. And so then this reflects all of those increases in all of those approved contracts. Um, and then one other that we did want to address that's included in here would be compensation uh, for the governing body as well. Deputy Mayor, if I may. Yes, yes Mr. Gruber. Ms. <coughs> During our budget one-on-ones, um, a number of council members uh, raised the issue of what it might take to look at governing body salaries for the council and the mayor. And so we thought we would, since we're talking about compensation and personnel costs, we thought we would raise that issue right now and give the governing body time to put some thought to that so that maybe by the time we get to the, our last budget meeting, there, if there is an interest from the collective, that there might be then some consensus on what that number might be. The first step in that process, if there is an interest, is to raise it here and to make sure it gets into the budget. And then subsequently, it would need to be in uh, sent to the council for <coughs> actual action via an ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Gerber. To the council body, do we have comments? I see Ms. Clear. So is this something we talk about now, or do we just go over this paper and then talk about that? I think that at this point in time, it's been brought up for discussion of the council body, and I would welcome comments of council members and the mayor, of course. Um, 
I think I have had some constituents call me and say, um, you guys don't, you, you do so much and you don't make enough. And that started, that started me thinking, huh, I wonder if that's true. I mean, I know, I know we do a lot, especially those without jobs. I see the mayor everywhere, I see um, Hiller everywhere, they're always on. Um, the rest of us, I know we have meetings. Now, doing the math, this is my math, someone needs to redo my math. I figured out we make like $9 an hour. Um, I don't know if there's anyone out there that would think that was enough. And, and I know we're not in it for the money. I know we're, we just want to be public servants. But at the same time, when was the last time there was a raise for the council? Five years ago. 2005. Deputy Mayor Council will clear that the last um, adjustment to that was in 2005. And just by way of further clarification right now, I'm sure everyone is aware, but t it's $10,000 for city council members and $20,000 a year for the mayor. And do you know how that goes along with other cities? I know um, we're above some and below some. You know. Councilwoman, we, we can certainly look into that. So again, maybe by the last meeting, we would have some better numbers for you. We don't have any, any uh, direct comparisons right now, but I think you're right on that we're above some and below some. But there isn't an ordinance or anything that says every few years you look at the council's pay. Does this just come up because someone brings it up? No. Correct. Correct. City manager. Yeah. Thank you, deputy mayor. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went through the process where we had the citizen review committee uh, that made certain suggestions. We're talking about many of those during the council. Items. One of the suggestions that was made. One of the suggestions that that was made uh, was that we did look at at the uh, compensation for the elected officials. So this is consistent with that activity, also. Ms. Ortiz. Thank you. Um, yes, it was raised in 2005, and at 2005, I think they were getting 250 a month. I personally will not ask for a raise. I will let the citizens take it to vote and say if they want me to have a raise. Because I, I think sometimes, I, and I understand, I, my calculations are 50 cents an hour. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I understand where everybody's coming from, but I think sometimes um, people feel like we make too much money. So my support on this would be to take it to the um, people and let them vote on it like they did last time to vote for us. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councilwoman Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is always a delicate issue Absolutely. in no matter what elected body that you serve. And I know a lot of um, different elected bodies choose to tie it with the uh, CPI <laughs> um, that we just talked about a little bit earlier. And so I would like to see if that could be researched, if there are cities that do tie their um, elected bodies, the salaries and stuff to a CPI index that increases or decreases. So um, if we could do that, it really, I know um, those, those bodies that do that, whether it's legislatures or even Congress, um, that it takes it out of your hands then of having to vote for yourself a raise. That's right. So, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Councilwoman. Councilman Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think part of this conversation uh, really centers around what does our community want from its elected leaders? Uh, I love working on the council and working on the various things in the community, but I have to stop making money essentially to do so. And so to some degree that, that limits the amount of time I'm physically, financially able to spend on council work, on volunteering, on things in the community because I have to make money to live. And so to some degree, if we pay the council more, then that should give us the ability to do some more things in the community because financially we're able to, whereas you know, where it sits now, I, I do as much as I can with the amount of time I can spend away from my job. And I expect that most of you all are in the same boat. So part of the conversation is, what does our community want from us? Do they want us to spend more time working on these issues? And if so, yes, you know, you're going to have to pay us more because we have to live too. So I think that's to be part of our discussion as we get down the road. Thank you. Any other comments? 
Councilwoman Ortiz. Well, Mr. Jensen, when I took this job, I mm -hmm. knew it was part time. And I think the um, citizens want part time council members. You know, this discussion mm -hmm. came up ever since 2005 mm -hmm. that, you know, we should have full time council members. And I would love to be a full time council mm -hmm. member um, with full time pay, but that's not what the citizens voted for. And so I will honor their wish. Mm -hmm. I took that job under that understanding. Mm -hmm. And I have 19 NIAs, 15 to 19. So, you know, I, I, it's, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. um, Councilman Jensen, and then we'll go back to Councilwoman Clear. Thank you. And I, I do agree. Uh, you know, currently we're set up as part time council people. Um, I think our community really wants us to be full time, whether they have come out and said it or not, and just the amount of things that we could do if we were. Now, I'm not advocating for us to become full time. Council people, I have a, a job I dearly love, um, but maybe three quarters time or something along those lines. Councilwoman Clear. I think my constituents think I'm full time. I mean, they may well, want they part time, yeah. mm -hmm. but they get full time. And I think because, I mean, you wouldn't be on this council if you weren't a helping person. Because we want to help and because we are there for people, we do it um, full time. Most of us. I mean, if you add up the hours, it's full time. Some of us more than full time. And I know it's a delicate subject, but if you're in a position at a job, you expect a raise. Um, if if you do a good job, you get a raise. So it's. Um, I I don't think my constituents are going to be upset about this, because it's just it. I just think it's the right thing. Councilwoman Ortiz. Ms. Clear, I do a good job. I work for the state of Kansas, so we haven't had a raise for eight years. Not even a cost of living, with all due respect. <laughs> At this point in time, I would like to ask for the, the staff if it would be possible at all for us to have an evaluation for the next meeting of what other municipalities are doing, and if we could also address the CPI um, formula that is being utilized in other communities. That way we could just come back to the body with further information on that. Also with comparables of other municipalities of our MSA size so that we could take a look at where we stand. Would, would, would the body would be amicable to that suggestion? Thank you, great discussion. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just want to clarify, so because this got brought up, this isn't in terms of a recommendation on the amount of staff. Because this got brought up, we understand that this has to be a discussion um, through the body, but that will ultimately result in an ordinance and an action taken by this body. We just didn't want to not have a financial consideration given to this early on. So we just wanted to include it in the budget, and uh, we will proceed as you directed. Absolutely. This is the perfect time to have this discussion because if it were to come up later on in the year, it would be kind of difficult to go ahead and work it into the numbers. Councilwoman Hiller. Um, Deputy Mayor, question and comment. The question is, are we going to go back through and go through these departmental budgets? Because we as a council haven't addressed our council budget yet. Are, will we do this later? We will have a discussion today of the overview and then we will go into details in the next two meetings later okay uh, the comments would be that I, I I don't know that I've ever compared notes with everyone but for us to think about that and, and even staff um, in those other communities I don't know what other costs are covered or provided by those cities but many of us spend a lot of time driving around, buying our own tickets to all the things that our, our constituents want, making contributions here and there to various things. And I suspect that most of us spend all that money on this job rather than, you know, live on it. And so that might be something for each of us to consider ourselves as, as we consider what's reasonable about those dollars. I also did note that something we've talked about the last number of years actually is putting some training money in so that at least we can all feel like we can do a good job and not have to spend our own money to go get some training. And I, I, that's not in here yet. So if, if that comes up later, I, it is? Mm -hmm. Oh, I couldn't. I looked for We it. took that out of the budget. We had training and took it out. And, well, it's not there. It's only 1500 bucks for the whole council. Councilwoman Hiller, th those points are very well taken. I think that at this point in time, unless we have any other questions with regards to this issue, um, we can proceed with the uh, overview. I know. 
Ms. Lee? Um, let's just clarify that real quick. On page 18, we did add $12,000 to oh, gotcha. council training. Yeah. Great. Um, so we can um, talk about that more later, but I guess the idea was to put enough in there that it would be enough to cover several big trainings or a little bit for everybody, but that is built into the budget. Thank you. I looked yes. in the 2016 column. Sure. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, so part of those full-time salaries, as I mentioned, were six new positions. Um, and as we've explained and uh, talked to a lot of you about, um, we're very, very conscientious and careful before any new positions are added to the budget. There's a very long vetting process. Where possible, we like to take existing positions and reallocate. So um, these are not, uh, these don't get into the budget very easily. And we believe that the new positions that are in the budget really speak to council priorities or their items that really were contractually obligated to do. So the six positions that do relate to the general fund, two are in the technical services group in the public works department. And that group, that's the group that does all of our GIS mapping and our asset management. Um, uh, for a very long time, they operated with four positions. They had a few scattered throughout the utilities. We're kind of putting a new focus on this group because you've seen from a lot of the presentations we've made to you with uh, maps, with the CIP, and with our assets, we can't get to where we want to be with our streets and our utilities and our overall asset management without the people there to do that. Um, the good thing about these positions is that we actually spread the cost of these positions over um, all of the major departments and utilities. So the general fund share at this point is only actually 16% of these positions. Um, water, stormwater, wastewater, really anybody that's impacted by the asset management and the mapping pays in to help pay for these positions. There are two new zookeepers built into the budget and that is to continue to meet appropriate standards in zoo and animal care and also in anticipation of the zoo master plan and future zoo expansion. Um, we simply felt like it was time to um, expand the number of staff that we have in the zoo. And then additionally, there's two positions in, in fire. So for several years, uh, you all probably have etched in your head 245, 245. That's the number of people in the fire department. We are at the point right now where we believe we need to have a special focus on the medical care side of our fire department since the majority of our calls are related to um, EMS, emergency medical type positions. So we actually have an emergency medical services director built into the budget that will oversee those operations and also a training officer that would assist that person in making sure that we're having good quality control, um, good training on all of the state requirements that our fire department needs to be trained in. So that concludes my comments about the full-time salaries. Um, and what I'll do is I'll pause after each of these items to see what follow-up questions there are. Does the body have any follow-up questions? Councilwoman Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last year, in looking back at the minutes and stuff, we and I don't know if this is appropriate time for it, but um, I know that I added a grant writer or grant consultant that we did. So I'd like a report on the grant issues through the, with the city. I don't know if, if you know that needs to be done at a later meeting, but um, we did add what sixty thousand last year for a grant writer. Um, so I'd like kind of a report on that and where we're at with our grants and writing grants. Sure. You don't mind? We'll include that in the Q and A follow up to this meeting. Thank you. And that is um, that position is still in the budget. Yes. Councilwoman Clear. I don't know if this is the right time either, or wait till we get to the individual. But on the comp time callback pay for fire, did we did we not address that in their contract? And we were really trying to lower that amount, but but it has increased. Um, I can I can go ahead and speak to that item. Okay, so let's see though. The fifth item down is related to callback. And you can see that increases 193,000. And just so you know, what callback is, is that's used to meet minimum staffing. So if there's ever a situation where in the fire department, for whatever reason, and this could be um, someone is sick, someone's doing training, someone is out, that we need to meet minimum staffing, then we use uh, what's called callback pay to make sure that we have the right employees in the positions where we need them to be. And um, it's been updated in the 17 budget to better match actuals. So we have been really under budgeting this line. And I think to your point, um, with the goal of 
um, addressing callback and where possible have our staffing to where it need to be and have the situations where we need callback um, under control and kind of restricted where they need to be. Um, and I'd say at this point we just realized that we've been under budgeting that line so it's time to simply bring it up to where it needs to be. So now what you see it as reflects how much we've really been spending. So how does the callback pay um, compare with pay? I mean is it double time, time and a half? How does that compare? I couldn't tell you that 100% off the top of my head. We can maybe would there be a parking City lot manager. item so that we could go ahead and come back to it and have the information? City manager. City manager. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Mayor um, and Councilmember Claire. So we want to come back um, with this item and really kind of give an overview. We do believe it's one of the elephants in the room. Unfortunately, uh, Chief Wayne has had a longstanding commitment uh, for today and Wednesday that he's not able to participate. So we've, we're challenging him to come back and kind of give an overview of where we stand on many of these items. But your, your original question is right on. Managing that is absolutely vital. The whole concept of overtime and callback and all that is one of the things that we need to address. And uh, Nikki uh, had made a statement that this is where it needs to be. It's not where it needs to be. It's where it is. And so we wanted to recognize the reality of the financial situation that is today, but we want to continue to address that going forward. But with your uh, permission, We'll put it in the parking lot, but it really isn't a parking lot. It's a planned conversation mm -hmm. to have uh, a little bit. Thank you. And quickly, I, my uh, handy audience back here did clarify, um, it is time and a half is the rate. There we go. Well, um, if I may, yes. I'm glad, I'll comment, I'm glad to see us um, increase that because it's, it's long overdue by nobody's fault other than um, by statute, we have to have so many people on a truck, um, you know, and we can't control fires. Um, we can't control if one staff comes in and another staff leaves, you know, or needs to leave, that they have to stay over. Um, just like when we had some of those big uh, fires on different sides of towns, they, could, they can't just walk off the job and leave. So I'm glad to see that we've increased this. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Emerson, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Nikki, I just had a question because I, I went through the book, well, most of the book last night, and and maybe this is going to be on all these, but the number, so you have a comp time callback pay here, 545.096, and, and in the book, when you go to the detail sheet, it doesn't, it's 496.059, unless there's some other, maybe, there, maybe this is consolidating several numbers, I don't know. Is that going to it be the case everywhere? Yes, thank you. So I meant to clarify that from the start is just kind of explain the setup of this page. So I didn't even go get it. what you see in the 2017 budget column is the aggregate of every department throughout the book that's got that item. So like, for example, on this callback line, that's, that's grabbing that account for every single department in the general fund that's got that. <coughs> And then um, as you go to the right where you see the increase and the decrease and then the column that labels who that's for, like for example on this one it says fire, right. it may actually be that a small amount of that change is attributed to another department. I've simply put oh, the department okay. here that's responsible for the majority of it. Okay. And I'll try to explain that throughout where that happens, but you're right, you, you can't open to necessarily the fire department and see those same numbers. It's just they were the ones driving the biggest change. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Any other questions, comments from the body? We can move forward. Thank you, Councilwoman Clear. We got another one. I can check that one off the list. Just took care of two and one item. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, next we go down to employer contribution for health insurance. As you can see in the general fund alone, this is at this point an $844,000 increase, 17 over 16. Um, so this is one of the biggest impacts to our budget, of course, is the cost of our health care. And this is the amount that the city, so the employer, contributes towards the plan. Um, of course, um, employees that are on the plan contribute as well. And at this point, um, we are budgeting for a 13.5% increase over 2016 <coughs> actuals, which actuals were higher than the original budget. So what we do every year is we set the budget amount but we don't actually get our renewal rates from all of our, um, our uh, benefits and our uh, benefit consultants until about July. 
And the reason is they need to wait for as much history in the year as they possibly can before they're coming to us and saying what next year's rates are going to be. Well, we, of course, need to be setting that a lot earlier in the budget so we know how much to set aside. So our budget amount is rarely what the actual amount is. And for example, in 2016, our rates came in a little bit higher than we'd originally budgeted. Um, the main <coughs> reasons for the increase that you see in 2017, um, one would be just the, simply the costs of um, health care, which any of you that deal with that maybe in your businesses or personally are pretty familiar with this is something that's happening everybody everywhere especially on the prescription drug side mm -hmm. um, even generics we're seeing costs of these are just skyrocketing in addition unfortunately in 2015 and so far in 2016 we've had some very high claims years among our employees and we will be diving into this a lot more on june 28th that's the the third budget committee meeting we plan to focus on the health fund and any other funds so we will give you a report, um, for example, on the wellness clinic and the impacts that's had. Um, and we'll also talk a lot more about, we can, we can dive as much into the health care as you all want to. At this point, we're, we're hoping that we're being conservative and putting more in the budget than we need. Um, we won't know for the next couple of months, but we'd rather put more than less. Um, additionally, um, one important item to note is that uh, we will also be talking to you as a governing body pretty soon about where we are with our cost share negotiations with the union. So if you're not aware, um, we have a negotiating um, requirement with all the seven union groups and the staff sit together and decide what the cost share rates will be. So for example, this year, employees pay only 3% of their health care and the employer, so the city pays 97%. That's a negotiated item that we sit down with every year. And at this point, we haven't come to an agreement. Um, so that's another unknown at this point that we're hoping to solidify pretty soon. But right now, we'd rather just assume higher than we think that we need. Yes, Councilwoman Clear. Can you tell me the number of employees that you contribute health insurance for? Um, I'm going to follow up with you on that exact number um, only because. Uh, we have a total number that includes uh, some retirees and current employees. I know it's around 900, but I'm going to send you the final one. But on that note, something really important to know is that when we have vacancies, so for example, when we set the budget, we had about 50 vacancies. We do budget because we have to assume that those people <coughs> might be coming in on our plan. So we always know we're budgeting more than we're probably going to be spending um, because you have to assume that everybody all of those people will be on but let me send you the exact amount if that's okay councilwoman killer thank you deputy mayor um thank you uh, for making commitment that this will come back on the 28th for more of a deep dive when we do that um could could we i know there are lots of moving parts in this health care system that that add into this number um we thought, those of us that have been on for a little while, that we were right on top of cost containment for health care, at least I did, and that the clinic process was supposed to, to plateau and then reduce our expenses, so we invested in that. I really am interested in, in that, how each of those moving parts are working, or, and we also thought it would make our, I know it's early in that long-term plan, but that, that we could reduce the the incidents and the health care expenses for our employees overall. So I'm surprised to see it go up uh, and, you know, concerned, of course. Also, though, the 13.5 percent, if that could be recalibrated into what difference that means in terms of, I mean, if it's 97 percent, it's going to stay that way. I mean, like 13.5 percent of a hundred dollars is 13.50, but of 10 bucks is just a dollar and some change so I'm not you know per employee what does that 13.5 percent mean mr. Gerber if I may just for the the body's um, reminder the clinic we do believe is going to be a positive for our employees mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we have to keep in mind whether it's a clinic or <coughs> you no know, employees we added for public works last year in both of those cases we're very new into the process the clinic is has really not even been open for a year, hasn't been open for a year. And so not to make any sort of grand promises, but I think it's it's very early to be seeing the sort of cost savings we might be expecting in the future. Additionally, I think 
anyone recognizes who's been through this, that when you have um, a clinic that opens up, one of the things that often happens is people go and they find things that maybe they hadn't seen before. And so there is always the potential of an initial escalation in cost, which should plateau then once it gets treated appropriately. Uh, I'll go to Councilwoman Schwartz and then we'll come back to Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I try, I was on that committee and really spearheaded a lot of this discussion to do the clinic and the HRAs, the health risk assessments. I've seen this happen before with other employers and what happens, as Doug said, is the woodwork effect. You have people who have not really been getting health care, now getting health care. Um, you all, we also will be moving, and I've you know tracked with Jackie and Michelle and the entire committee as to when we will start doing the health risk assessment categories, and that's what Olathe and other cities that are using this, that's why they're saving lots of money. Yeah. And those health risk assessment categories means that an employee, based on their health risk and their assessment, they are placed in a sort of category, and then their goal is to, to improve, to, to have their health actually improve. So it's not that we just have a free clinic. We have a clinic that is helping people to improve their health. And I've been assured that probably next year we're going to move into that aspect. And for people that improve their clinics, like Olathe that's doing this or Salina, they actually have bonuses for employees that improve. So you're watching your blood pressure, you're watching everything that needs to be done. So the first year is always expected to have a little bit of a woodwork effect, but we will move into Olathe, I think, if I'm not incorrect, Nikki, they get $6 back for every dollar they invest in their program. So. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And again, just the deep dive to understand that, whether it's we've got a lot of people that we're retaining with major illnesses or whether it's you know, preventive care or attending to long-term things, just to understand. Also, you touched on something. I mean, if the 13.5% is because we've added employees, that helps to explain it to me as well. I mean, whatever that really means is what I was asking. Thank Any you. additional comments from the body or questions? Okay, we could proceed. Okay. The third item on here in the, is employer retirement reserve contribution. Um, there's a little bit of discussion about this in the budget book. So what that is is that we have a designated fund set up to handle payouts when employees retire. So we have, um, with our personnel code, it designates when an employer retires, um, how much we pay of the vacation time, how we pay out comp time. Um, and as you can imagine, sometimes with long-term employees, just like any um, a government entity, they build up, they can potentially build up um, an impact that would be a big impact on the budget in one given year. So the way that we handle that is actually for every dollar that we pay towards an employer, towards an employee's pay, their whole career with the city, we're actually, as a city, contributing a percentage of that pay into this fund to plan for the future. So for a non-KP and F employee, we pay 2.25% on every dollar we kick into a retirement reserve fund to be able to help pay for that employee's future um, costs. We pay a little bit more on the KP and F side. It's 2.75% um, because simply because they have uh, larger payouts when they retire. Um, we increase to those percentages I just stated this year because uh, we will be expending through the employee separation fund. For those of you that were here in 2013, we were coming up to a large bubble of employee retirements. And at that point, our funds were all in some pretty terrible situations where we knew that uh, we couldn't handle the the <coughs> cost that they would have on our budget. So we actually um, took out bonds to finance for the next couple of years of retirement. So that was in 2013. We're expecting to have paid through that in 16. So we've had a very, very large group of retirees that we will run through that fund. Um, it is our goal. We never want to borrow money again to pay for retirements. That's um, It's allowable, but it's it's not a practice that you would like to continue. So, um, in order to prepare for that and to prevent for that, we needed to increase the amount that we were paying for ourselves for these future payouts. So what that impacts in this budget is um, $400,000 increase over last year. Um, this is simply good financial planning. 
this this needs to happen so we're not in the position in future years. Mr. Emerson. Deputy Mayor, thank you. Uh, Nikki, on that, is there, I, I, I guess, are there other implications to that? Uh, I, I know for CAPERS, what is it, your last two years or something determined? Is there, is there some, I guess, is there some games going on there that if you keep that, does that count then and you can up up retirement and everything? Is there, is there an impact other than just that year's money? I mean, should this be things we're paying out every year to people? cashing out every year um, okay if I'm understanding your question this is actually um, this money is money that we're putting into our own fund so we are transferring it from whatever fund that employees paid out of for example the general fund into the retirement reserve fund and then once they get whatever payout it is per, per the personnel code it's paid out of that fund so um, I think to the employee, they don't know what fund they're getting paid out of, and there's really no way that can be manipulated. It, they're making that money no matter where we're paying it from. I don't know if that answer, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I just didn't know why don't we just ever at the end of every year, if you have 30 days accrued, why don't we just pay everybody that money? Is there a reason we don't do that instead of having this kind of unbudgeted amount hanging out here that we don't know from year to year? Hmm. Deputy City Manager. Deputy Mayor, thank you, Councilman. Uh, certainly some cities do approach um, those future liabilities that way, and they have policies whereby at the end of every year you get a portion of your vacation or a portion of your sick leave without leaving yourself um, vulnerable for the next year in case you need to have vacation or sick leave that you can use. That's certainly a policy and a philosophy. Um, the philosophy in the city of Topeka is that we fund from our operating budget towards those future liabilities. And as Nikki said, we're, we're trying to bolster that fund so that we don't put ourselves in a precarious situation in the future. So, but it, it's certainly a possibility. It's just not the way Topeka has traditionally approached it. All right. Nikki's whispering a good point in my ear. We, we do in terms of both contractual obligations and the personnel code, there are maximum limits set on both vacation and sick leave. So that also helps mitigate that risk a little bit. Okay. One more clarification, CAPERS is the final three years rather than the final two years. And do, do amounts, do these amounts go into that calculation? No. Councilman, Sorry. which which amounts, so I'm understanding you. So if you get, if you have $100,000 saved up in these and I don't know what the amounts are. I don't know what kind of amounts you're talking about per employee. But does that then go into your retirement? Or is that not considered? Mayor I, I think the, the issue, because we call this retirement, we're thinking that this is part of your capers, of your retirement you get for the rest of your life. But that's not what this is, correct? Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe the confusion is even the title. It's kind of like our future liability reserve. This is for the city to save up money for those payouts that we make on those employees. So it doesn't um, it doesn't have anything to do with the calculations of their retirements. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. It's a payout for your unused sick leave. Yeah. No. Is it? Maybe I can try to clarify this. The money that's in this retirement fund and previously the, I'm not sure what we called it, but the other fund that we took out bonds for is in case we have, and in fact, when we do have employees that retire across the city so that we're able to fund their benefits due to them that they've earned at so retirement, right. whether it's sick leave, whether it's vacation, yeah. whether it's their final payout. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's a number of factors yeah. that go into it. That's what those monies are used for. That way it doesn't come out of an individual department's operating budget and impact routine operations. Any, Mr. City Manager? Yeah, just to clarify, you asked a question right at the end. Does, does that payout count towards the CAPERS retirement amount? The answer is yes, it does. CAPERS, CAPERS takes the average of the last three years <coughs> of your salary, and if you were to have a 
a pension spike, um, you had that number was very high, but you said $100,000. Sure. But if you were to get certain payouts, yeah. that would be included into the final numbers. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Councilwoman Clear. So not to jump ahead, but then the next one is the sick and vacation. Is that not, is that just for when people are sick and vacation? It has nothing to do with when they leave. Yeah, so then this is, this is good. You're tying this all together for me. Thank you. Uh, this next one that you see here, this really doesn't have anything to do with any of those. This um, really is an accounting entry that we're getting away from per the change to how we're budgeting for items. This was simply an accrual that we used to budget for. So you can see in the 16 budget, it was like a negative 300,000. And that had to do with um, an internal accounting entry that we make for liabilities of people's accrued um, sick and vacation time. It's not a payout. It's simply an entry um, that really uh, we won't be really showing on the budget side anymore. So that's really a technicality. Um, it, but it, it may look like it's related, but really it's not. Any other questions from the body? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Callback, we touched on that. Um, comp training. So this line here um, looks to be an $89,000 increase. And what this is, is that per some of our contracts, we actually have employees that get compensated for having certain level of degrees, <coughs> so an associate, a bachelor's, and master's degree. Um, this is not new. We're simply accounting for it differently to be more transparent. Um, it used to be this was just included in their full-time salary calculation. We would just add it in with what that person's making because that's, you know, it's part of their paycheck. But in order to make it more visible how much we do pay out on items like that, we've designated it into its own account. So year over year, like I said, it looks like it might be an increase over 16, but actually it's the same rates. Um, it's just we're simply accounting for it in a different way. Um, as is stated here, this is in the uh, municipal court and police because it's in the FOP contract and then also um, fire due to IAFF. Questions? Did I see that was in municipal too? Yes, so we actually have a municipal court. We have public safety officers. Those are the ones that run our security mm -hmm. and they are part oh, of the FOP right. contract. Okay, yep. thank you. I was just wondering why it was there. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, and then the last one on this list is the CAPERS contribution. So CAPERS rate are provided to us by the state, and this is um, uh, their rates that they're set, that they set for what we need to contribute for every employee. So just like with the retirement reserve, you're probably all familiar with every dollar that we pay an employee, we also contribute towards CAPERS. Mm -hmm. Actually, the actual rate is going down from 9.18% in 16 to 8.97% in 17. So the rate itself is going down, but we're actually paying more into the fund because as we have an increased full-time salaries, we're going to be paying more in our CAPERS contribution. Questions on that? Okay. Okay, I did not mean to, but I'm sorry, I skipped over overtime. Is that what you're going to say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, overtime, so the overtime line um, increases by 75,000 in this budget. And again, that's all departments combined. Um, the majority of this is, you will find in the police department, a lot of this is because as we're paying employees more, um, they're actually, since their rate is higher, they're making more in overtime. But also on the police side, um, there's multiple kind of compensation accounts for different types of overtime. It, what, to you, it might seem like overtime, but technically there's differences. There's overtime, there's standby, there's callback. There's multiple different categories for when an employee works more than their normal shift. So actually in TPD, they decreased a couple of those other items. Um, so overall, uh, their items aren't increasing by this much, but the specific item time, tied to overtime does increase by this amount. Councilwoman Clear. Is any of this overtime due to not being up to staff on being undermanned in TPD? With your permission? Yes, yeah, City Manager's bringing up um, Chief Brown. Welcome, Chief Brown. Thank you, ma'am. 
Uh, council member clear. So in the overtime for police, that $75,000, we did completely away with the hazardous duty pay and we decreased our standby pay. So this is not an increase that we're asking from the governing body. This is just taking our hazardous duty pay and our standby pay and moving it to, to overtime. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? <clears throat> Councilwoman Ortiz. Does any of this affect our special units when we put together special units for, you know, like the gangs or different? Does any of that affect this? Yes. So during contract negotiations, we decided um, as a police department that that, for example, hazardous duty pay. We would rather see the money be utilized, for example, a month ago when we had three officers shot mm -hmm. during that warrant and then the uh, subsequent fire of the hotel that was a large amount of overtime exactly. that night for that one event and to be able to forecast those type of events we have to be prepared for those type of events but they consume a lot of manpower and a lot of dollars for that one specific event and so this is what helps on that is that correct yes ma'am okay i just wanted i just wondered how that worked because <clears throat> excuse me within the last year we've had a lot you mm -hmm. know with high crest with the um shooting out there um, continually, we're, we're still out there with special units with the gang um, shootings and stuff like that. So um, I'm glad to see this then. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Chief Brown. It's gotta go. it's gotta go. Thank you. All right, the next section we get down into uh, really what we call as our contractual items. So this, yeah. the contractual category um, does serve as a little bit of a catch-all for a lot of our kind of expenditures. It's things that we're paying um, to outside agencies, things that we're paying to ourselves. So really other, everything other than people or stuff falls into the contractual category. So on the top of the list there is our own contributions to our internal service fund IT. Um, so just as a little bit of a background, and there's more information in the book about how we fund our IT department, but our IT department is set up as an internal service. So we actually charge ourselves based on the department's number of employees, number of computers, and all of the um, other technical support that they have. Every year we annually reconfigure how much all of those departments need to pay in to our own IT fund for the support. And the IT fund increases, as you can see, over the seven, 16 budget increases 307,000. This is not, this does not mean that we're increasing our IT operations by that amount. Um, what this is reflecting is that we've actually reallocated in an appropriate way where those charges are occurring. So for the past couple of years, um, we have been charging other funds, um, so the utility funds, street fund, more than really was their due to be able to protect the general fund. And we're at the point right now where we're overall in the budget you'll see, and for the past couple of years, we're wanting to shift everything more appropriately. We no longer want to be charging other funds less or more than they should be paying. It needs to be based on a formula. So actually, this is bringing us to the point that we should be um, Additionally, they did have a small increase to their budget of just a 2% to be able to keep up with some increasing costs. But in the general fund, this is um, kind of a, a large impact in one year. Future years, this should be a smaller amount because we made a pretty large shift in just this one year. Councilwoman Clear. So you put shifted from other funds. So the other funds mm -hmm. went down decreased yep so for example um if i go to the water department it fee you'll see a pretty significant decrease from 16 to 17 um, because it was uh, they had been paying more than their share to protect some of the general fund departments so what is the actual increase because if you shift from here and put it here does it balance or is there oh, really an sure. increase sure so overall the it fund did increase by two percent um okay over the, oh, the I see prior overall year. fees. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Hiller. We've been, thank you. We've been adding a lot of um, features to some software that we already had and have been adding others, such as the budget portal and, and so on. Are all of those software expenses, installation and maintenance expenses in IT 
or are some of them still in departments? Okay. Um, I can clarify that. So generally, uh, it depends. I would say if we have department-specific softwares, usually departments are actually paying for those items. For example, Socrata, um, we are actually paying for out of finance because it's um, for the open checkbook portion and the portions related to performance. Okay. That would be more of a finance-related. Um, additionally, the expenses for Lawson, which is our, our ERP, our, our enterprise <coughs> research support um, programming, we actually pay... Uh, the majority of that annual fee out of the general fund um, so the IT fund pays for kind of the software the security the website so the kinds of supports that it, the kinds of items that affect the whole city um, that would include the IT staff as well but anytime there's a software that's department specific um, that will usually be paid by that specific department mr. Gerber deputy mayor thank you I want to pick up on a point Nikki mentioned in terms of shifting IT costs appropriately. Uh, it's a good story. For one thing, it's a best practice, and it's something we mm -hmm. should be doing. We did, we've done a cost allocation model, and I think that's very appropriate. But secondly, I think maybe an even more important point is as we move into a potential conversation about rates for our utilities, I think it's beneficial if we're not using the utilities as a cash cow for the general fund, but instead making sure that they're absorbing the costs that they're supposed to absorb and not other costs just because it was an easy budgeting practice at one point. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions with regards to this line item? Okay, we proceed. Okay. So that leads us very nicely into server licenses. Um, this is actually the, the support for our loss in annual maintenance. Um, we are actually doing an upgrade right now as we speak. Hopefully it's going well. It's literally happening right now. And um, the, the costs from 2017 over 16 are actually increasing by more than a usual annual increase amount because we are going to the cloud. <coughs> so it will now be hosted by a Lawson rather than by ourselves. Um, so there's probably a lot more technical behind that. But in the long run, this should mean that we have less of the support on that end from our own funds, um, but it does increase our annual costs. Mr. Emerson. I think Mr. Jensen maybe was. No, no, no. no. Th thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, is this going to be this much in perpetuity? I mean, or is this a one time? Uh, I, let me follow up. I know we have, I think we have a five-year rates from them, and I believe that the, the first couple of years are larger jumps, and then after year, afterwards we should see smaller. But if you don't mind, let me send that to you for sure, rather than assuming right now. Okay, and I guess the hope is we now will need less hardware, mm -hmm. we'll need less, so. Less energy, the whole nine yards. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Would you mind if I follow up with some? Absolutely. 